hi everyone welcome to my channel first of all i want to thank all of you who have subscribed to my channel because uh, we have finally reached 5000 subscribers and uh, even though 5000 is not that big a number in terms of youtube but it's still something yeah and uh, i've been working on this channel since some time and it makes me quite happy to see that 5000 of you have uh, subscribed to this particular channel and for that thank you very much to all of you who have subscribed and therefore for the sake of celebration i wanted to do something very interesting today so let's talk about arguably the most famous equation in physics e equals mc squared this is the mass energy equivalence principle given by albert einstein himself which is probably the most famous equation in physics everybody knows it physics students know about it even normal people who have nothing to do with physics know about this particular equation but if somebody asks you as a student of physics can you derive this equation can you prove this equation or can you come up with it through some argument how many of you can actually do that I think very few of you so let's spend some time today talking about the interesting the very interesting thought experiment using which we can actually prove this equation we can actually say that e is equal to mc squared so this is a thought experiment which was given by albert einstein himself almost more than 100 years ago and it is a very simple thought experiment involving very simple mathematics however some very conceptual and fundamental understanding so the thought experiment goes something like this imagine that there is a container or a box out there in deep space free from any kind of a force it is not experiencing friction it is not experiencing gravitational force either so there is a box or a container floating in deep space in complete isolation all right and inside this box there is a bulb or a light emitting source and on the other hand, there is some kind of an absorber that can absorb the light falling onto it. And this container or this system is at rest initially with respect to some kind of an inertial observer. So let's suppose there is a person or a scientist who is looking at this container and he is in some kind of a reference frame. He is an inertial observer and with respect to him, this container is at rest. Now what happens in this thought experiment is this. Imagine the light bulb emits a small beam of light at a particular instant. So when this light bulb emits a small beam of light, this light travels from left hand side to right hand side. Yes, quite simple. Now what happens when this light is emitted is that the container experiences a recoil. Why? Because light carries momentum. This is an idea that predates Einstein. This is an idea that can be derived from Maxwell's electromagnetism itself that whenever light is absorbed by a surface or light is emitted by a surface or light travels from point A to point B, then there is a momentum transfer that is associated with that motion of the light beam. And you don't have to think of light beam in terms of photons or in terms of electromagnetic waves that is not the point here the point is that whenever there is an electromagnetic radiation going from point A to point B then there is a momentum associated with it and using electromagnetism we can actually come up with an expression for the momentum associated with a particular light beam which is given by P is equal to I upon C. So what is I here? I is the intensity of that light radiation and C is the velocity of light. What is intensity? Intensity is a way of measuring the energy of that light radiation or that light beam, which is basically energy per unit time per unit area. So intensity I can here be just simply written as the energy carried by this particular light beam as it travels from left to right. Now as the light beam is emitted by the bulb and it travels in the right hand side direction, what happens is that the container experiences a recoil why well you can think of this as like a gun shooting a bullet so if you have a gun shooting a bullet the bullet goes from left to right the gun experiences a recoil because we have to conserve linear momentum if light carries momentum of its own that the same amount of momentum will be carried by the container as it moves towards the left hand side this has to happen otherwise we will violate conservation of linear momentum and that is one of the fundamental conservation laws of our universe the conservation of linear momentum now what happens after some time the light as it travels will finally reach the other end of the container it gets 
absorbed in the other end of the container. So when the light reaches the final wall of the container, the light is carrying some momentum, the container is carrying some momentum, they cancel each other out and the system again comes to rest. So initially the container was at rest, but when a light beam is emitted inside, the container will experience recoil and container will start moving towards the left hand side direction. As light reaches the other end, both will again come to rest. So this happens because of conservation of linear momentum. However, there is a problem here. Can you identify the problem? The problem is very simple. I already told you that from the perspective of this inertial observer, this container was initially at rest and this container is an isolated system free from any kind of an external force. So how can an isolated system move without any external forces acting on it? This violates Newton's first law. Newton's first law tells us that objects at rest will continue to be at rest and objects in motion will continue to be in uniform motion along a straight line until and unless some external force acts upon it and no amount of internal changes or internal forces or internal interactions can change this particular motion until and unless some external force acts upon it. This is a very necessary law to explain the workings of our universe. Why? Because otherwise we would not be able to explain why motion is happening. Objects would randomly start moving and objects would randomly start coming to rest. There would be complete chaos. Newton's first law is necessary to make sense of why objects are moving in the first place. So if I want to conserve momentum, then somehow it seems that Newton's first law is being violated, no? What if I imagine that the container was always at rest? In that case, I'll have to get rid of conservation of linear momentum. Now, conservation of linear momentum and Newton's first law are two of the most fundamental laws in mechanics. And somehow they are contradicting each other. We cannot just get rid of these two things because otherwise the universe would be completely chaotic. Objects would start speeding up, it will start slowing down automatically without any explanation. Objects would start moving and coming to rest automatically in a random chaotic manner without us being able to predict or explain what is happening. That is not feasible at all. So what is the solution to this particular problem? The solution was proposed by Einstein in a very simple manner. But before I tell you what the solution is, let's do some calculation. All right. So I already told you initially that the momentum carried by light is equal to the energy of the light given by the speed. Now the recoil of the container if the conservation of momentum has to be conserved will also have certain momentum associated with it. So let's suppose initially the container was here it started moving and finally it reached here and it again came to rest. Let's suppose the shift in the distance of this particular point A is let's suppose del x. All right, and this shift in distance happens in the x axis and it takes a time period of let's suppose del t. All right, so what is going to be the momentum of the container? The momentum of the container is then can be defined as the mass of the container multiplied by its velocity. Now let's suppose the mass of the container is m, all right? And the, what is velocity? V is the distance traveled per unit time. So velocity is nothing but the distance traveled by the container in time del t. So the momentum of this container is nothing but m del x upon del T. Now conservation law of momentum tells us is that the momentum carried by the light is going to be exactly equal to the momentum of the container itself. So that means the momentum of the container which is mass of container multiplied by del x upon del t is equal to the momentum of light which is E upon C. All right. Now what is del t here? So del t is the time in which the container goes from this position to this position, yes. That is the same time period in which the light goes from one end of the container to the other end of the container. So when the light is emitted at point A, it starts moving in the right hand side direction and finally reaches the point B, which is now B double dash, that is the time period del T. So when the light travels from one end of the container to the other end of the container, it does not travel this particular distance because the container itself is also traveling in the opposite direction. It basically travels from A to this particular point. So this is the distance that light basically travels 
before it strikes the opposite end of the container. So as the light travels from A up to B double dash, then the time period taken is del T. Now let's suppose that this distance, this length that light has to travel as it is emitted at point A and it is as it is absorbed in point B double dash is L, all right? So please note that L here is not the length of the container, but rather it is the distance between the initial point where the light is emitted and the final point where the light is absorbed. So this is the distance L. So if the time period taken is del T, in that case, del T is nothing but the distance traveled by light divided by the speed of light, yes. So del T is the distance traveled by the light divided by the speed of light C. Now we already know from the second postulate of special relativity, the speed of light is always the same no matter from what kind of an inertial frame of reference you're looking at it. Whether you are at rest or whether you're at motion doesn't matter. The speed of light will always be equal to C. So from this person's perspective, the time taken by the light is basically this distance divided by the speed of light. And we can use this here in this particular equation. So let's use this equation here. In that case, m del x upon del t is nothing but L upon C is equal to E upon C or m del x is equal to E upon C square multiplied by L. Now let's keep note of this particular equation because this is going to be helpful to us. Let's suppose this is equation number one. All right. Now coming back to what Einstein proposed to make sure that Newton's first law and the conservation law of momentum did not violate each other. How can we resolve this particular contradiction? So as I already told you, conservation law of momentum tells us that the container moves towards the left. However, Newton's first law tells us is that isolated systems should be at rest and it should not move until and unless external forces acts upon it. So the way Einstein resolved it goes something like this. Now, according to electromagnetism, light radiation or wave has momentum associated with it, but they do not have mass. So Einstein proposed that along with the momentum associated with light, there is also a mass associated with light. So when light is moving from A to B, then there is also an amount of mass associated with this light energy that is moving from A to B. So this simple explanation can prevent the violation of either conservation of law of momentum and Newton's first law because if there is a mass associated with the motion of light, that means even though from the outside this container has moved, the center of the mass of this container and this container will remain the same, which is what Newton's first law is. In a system of particles, the center of mass will not change until and unless external forces act upon it, even though the particles inside the system might change their location based upon internal forces. So what is the center of mass of these two systems? So the center of mass initially for the container before light was emitted can simply be written as, let's suppose the mass of the container itself is capital M, but the mass associated with the motion of the light energy is let's suppose small m. All right. So this was the center of mass initially. But what about the center of mass after the container seems to have shifted by some amount? So later on, or finally, the center of mass is nothing but capital M multiplied by x1 minus del x. Why minus del x? That's because the container has shifted by an amount of del x towards the negative x axis. So if this is the positive x axis, the container from outside seems to have shifted by del x amount. So the final center of mass for the container is m x1 minus del x plus the mass of light and the final position of light, which is initially the light was at x2, right, which is at a, but once the light has moved to the other end, so the distance that light has shifted is a distance of L. So this can be written as m x2 plus L, all right, divided by capital M plus 
small m. So as I said, the entire system consisting of the container and the light photon has a center of mass which will be unchanged because this setup is in an isolated surrounding free from any kind of an external force. So the center of mass of these two initial and final configuration should be unchanged. That means this is equal to this. So if we equate both these two equations, then this becomes mx1 plus small mx2 divided by capital M plus small m is equal to capital M x1 minus del x plus small m x2 plus capital L divided by capital M plus small m, which the denominators get cancelled and you're left with capital M x1 plus small m x2 is equal to capital M x1 minus capital M del x plus small m x2 plus small m capital L. m x1 gets cancelled, small m x2 also gets cancelled and you are left with capital M del x is equal to small m capital L. So let's suppose this is equation number two that we have obtained. So now let's use equation two in equation number one and see what we get. So if we use equation two in equation number one, we can say that m del x is equal to small m capital L, which is equal to e upon c square L. So this can be written as small m capital L is equal to e upon c square capital L. LL gets cancelled and you end up getting e is equal to m c square. So this is the mass energy equivalence principle or E equals mc squared where E is the energy of the light photon and m is the mass of the light photon and c is the speed of light. So this is how you can actually prove the equation E is equal to mc squared using a very simple sort of an idea in this particular thought experiment. Now what Einstein proposes is that not just light energy, any kind of energy, sound energy, chemical energy, wherever there is energy, then that energy is always associated with a certain amount of mass, where the mass is given by m is equal to e upon c squared. In this case, the motion of light energy from point A to point B dash is also associated with the transfer of amount of mass m is equal to e upon c square. Now of course this is a very specific example for the case of light photon but Einstein proposed that this is a general statement that can be made for both energy as well as mass. If there is an energy e then that energy is associated with it an amount of mass m and if there is an amount of mass m then that mass has associated with it a certain amount of energy e where the quantification of these two values is given by e is equal to mc square. Now how to convert the energy to mass or how to convert the mass to energy is a completely different sort of a challenge. It's an experimental challenge. That is not what Einstein is talking about, but rather he's talking about the quantification of an energy and a mass which is associated with each other. So that is one interesting way in which you can derive this particular or prove this particular uh, equation, uh, the most famous equation in physics. So now I think uh, if somebody tells you how to prove this, you know how to do it. So I hope that you have learned something from it and also enjoyed this particular interesting problem. So thank you very much for watching the video and thank you once again for subscribing to my channel. Hope to see you in the next one.